Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody back again, and uh, we're ready to get into program number three for this afternoon, and we got one more left. Which reminds me, for those of you out in television, if you call or write and you want today's program, just ask for book 46. Now, of course, before it's in print, it'll be a little while. The uh, tapes are usually ready almost after the third month, but uh, the books, of course, take a little longer by the time they're transcribed and edited and printed. But uh, anyway, if you're patient with us, sooner or later, the books are ready. We now have uh, 44 is the last one out. We're waiting for 45, and we're in the first two hours of number 46. And again, for those of you that have just joined us, we're just an informal Bible study. Nothing I like better than when they write and say, I just feel like I'm in the back of the class. Well, that's great, because uh, that's all we are. We're, we're just hopefully a teaching ministry. I always tell people, I don't preach at you. I don't think I do. And uh, we just like to show from the Scriptures what God would have us to know. And uh, I imagine we've all been in the same boat. I know I was. I just didn't know how little I really knew. And uh, when you start studying, it's amazing how, how simple it really is. It, it's not all that difficult if you just simply follow the Scripture as it unfolds. All right, we're going to go right on back into Hebrews chapter 1. We're still in verse 2. Yeah, we still got that on the board. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. And uh, hath in these last days, remember I pointed out in the last program, that is the period of Christ's first advent. They were the last days according to all of the Old Testament prophecies. And so now he hath in these last days spoken unto us by Son, there is no his in the original, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Now just stop. You know, I think we're all guilty. We read so fast that we really don't read. What does it mean to be appointed heir? Well, they get everything. You know, we like to read of the heir of some great big corporation or whatever the Vanderbilt family or the Rockefeller family and we'll read of the great wealth and what do they'll say? Well, they're the, heir, they're the heir of so and so's fortune. So we're well acquainted with what it is to be an heir. But you see, the triune God again, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit have in unison made the Son the heir of everything. All right, let's go back to Philippians. Back to Philippians, honey, chapter 2. And, and this again says it all in, in a different light than Hebrews because I, I'm going to keep stressing that, that Hebrews is written with the idea of showing the Jewish people that Jesus of Nazareth was not just a martyr. He was not just a prophet. He was... God the Son. He was the creator of everything. And so now Philippians in chapter 2, Paul I think covers the whole realm of Christ's coming and what he accomplished. <clears throat> Philippians 2, dropping down to verse 5. Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, remember John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was with God, all right? And so this Jesus, the Christ, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery or it wasn't anything that he was doing that wasn't appropriate to be equal with God. Verse 7, but of his own volition, he made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant, or a bond slave is a better term, and was made in the likeness of men as he was born of the Virgin Mary. 
but he was still God. And we're going to be showing that as we go further in Hebrews. He never stopped for a moment being a part of that Godhead. Verse 8, being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself again, see. Rome didn't humble him. The Jewish leaders didn't humble him. He humbled himself, see, and became obedient unto death. Now, I suppose we've all got our pet ideas of how we can picture some of these things, but the one that's freshest on my mind is when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane, and when Peter suddenly saw what they were trying to do to his Lord, what does Peter do? Well, he draws his sword, the little scabbard, no doubt, that they carried more or less like today you would carry a, a sidearm. Peter pulls his little sword and cuts off the ear of Malthus. Well, was that in agreement with the mind of Christ? No, no, he wasn't, he wasn't fighting to protect himself and to show Peter how completely wrong he was. And I imagine it was by an act of God that Peter only hit the fellow's ear but the Lord put his ear back on, miraculously. And it was to show Peter that, listen, we're not fighting against this with weapons. I'm not trying to avoid the cross. And he became obedient. And as he said himself, he could have called down, what, 12 legions of angels? And they would have come to his rescue, but he chose not to. And so he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. But don't stop there. Wherefore, because of his total obedience to the th plan of the triune God, wherefore God, there it is again, that triune Godhead, which included himself. And so, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. Now, I'll let you enlarge on the word exalt. What does it mean? I mean, it's to give him all the praise that is his due. And that God himself has exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. There is not a name that has ever been on the planet that came even close to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. All right, and in verse 10, this is going to be the final fruition of everything, that at the name of Jesus, every knee, every knee, the Hitlers, the Mussolinis, the Stalins, the Maos, the Napoleons, you name it, every one of them are going to stand before him and fall on their knees and recognize who he is. All right, And every knee will bow of things in heaven and things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All right, now, when it comes to heirship, we can't leave out our own role. We as believers are also called heirs. Now come back with me to Romans chapter 8. My, this ought to be enough to inflate every one of us to where we're almost hard to stay earthbound because this is our prospect. This is what's coming. This is why Paul says that suffering is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to us. Romans chapter 8, dropping down verse 16 and 17. <clears throat> Romans 8, verse 16 and 17. Oh, well, we might as well go on down and read 18 as well. But verse 16, the Spirit Himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if we're children, then we are what? Heirs, 
just like in an earthly family. The child is the heir of all of the father's wealth. See that? And so then we're heirs of God. And we're joint heirs with who? Christ. Unbelievable. But that's our prospect, that he is the heir of everything that's ever been created or ever will be, and we, in turn, are a joint heir with him. My, isn't that enough to just kind of shun the things of this world for a little while? And they think we're missing it. Well, I got news for them. We're not missing anything. They are. They're missing everything. Because the world is nothing but a pig pen by comparison to the glory that will be revealed to us. All right? Then uh, reading on in verse 17, If so be that we suffer with him, we may also be glorified together. For I reckon, Paul writes, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed to us. Now, I was just talking with someone the other day. You know, the Bible doesn't tell you. You can be turning back to Hebrews again. The Bible really doesn't give us an awful lot of information on our eternal state, does it? We really don't know how we're going to function or what we're going to be doing. Or we can speculate, but we really don't know. But what do we know? It is going to be so fabulous that language could never express it. It is going to be so glorious. It is going to be so pleasurable. And it will be for all eternity. Not just for 70 or 80 years, but for an eternity. All right, so back to Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 2 again, finishing it up. And so God hath spoken. Through Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. And then we've already covered the last part of the verse in our first program. By whom also he made the worlds. He created everything. Now let's move on to verse 3. Oh, another loaded verse. I suppose we could go several programs on just verse 3. But I'm not going to. We'll try to keep moving ahead. Verse 3. Who, speaking of Son who, being the brightness of his, what? Glory. glory. Whose glory? The Godhead. The whole triune God. Now we got just a little glimpse of that back in Matthew, I think it's chapter 17. Come back with me, honey. Matthew chapter, yeah, 17. Just a little window. Just a little glimpse. But it should be enough to just make our hearts leap because we're going to be partakers of this in the full one day. And we think we're getting close. Oh, my land, when I read and when I hear what's going on today, it just can't be much longer. The technology that's exploding so far as the military is concerned why, it'd be enough to make the masses panic, I would think, if they knew what our military already has. Not just on wishful thinking, they've got it. And then I'd read an article again yesterday, the gross, gross, vulgar immorality amongst our 12 and 14-year-old school kids. It just scares you to your socks of what's coming. But it, on the other hand, encourages us that we as believers are one day soon going to get a full view of this glory. Not just a glimpse, we're going to be in it. All right, but here is just that little window. Matthew 17, starting at verse 1. And after six days, Jesus takes Peter and James and John and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart from all the rest of the activity, even from the other nine. Now verse 2, And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the what? 
the sun. Now look, we can't look on the sun without being blinded. And I imagine somehow or other the, the three, James and John, Peter, James and John, were protected from it, or they too would have been blinded as Saul of Tarsus was on the road to Damascus. But here he was transfigured before them, and suddenly that lowly Jesus of Nazareth who had been walking those dusty roads of the nation of Israel is transfigured, and he does shine like the sun. And his raiment was as white as light. Now there again, we can't comprehend the brightness of that kind of light. Now you all know the experience of Saul of Tarsus on the road to Mass, and I think it was that same light. And it just literally blinded him. It just scarred his eyes when he was confronted with that light from the person of the sun. All right, so coming back to Hebrews chapter 3, so the Son, the one who had walked the earth, had humbled himself to be crucified and slain, and had, as he said on the cross, it's finished. Nothing else can be added to it. Nobody can put their fingers to the work that Christ accomplished. It's all done. All right, so he being the brightness of his, God's glory, and the express image of his person. Now, I think sometimes people get the wrong idea from Genesis where it says that God created man in his image. Now you want to remember at the time of creation, God had never appeared in human form so far as we know from Scripture. He was what? He was spirit. And so he didn't create Adam in likeness of a physical body that the Godhead had. They didn't have one. They were spirit. And so when it says that Adam was created in God's image, it merely meant in the person of the personality in his mind, and his will, and his emotion. That's where Adam was in God's image. And as I pointed out when we taught back in Genesis, how many of those three entities that make up every one of us can anybody see? None of them. Nobody, nobody can take a mind and lay it on an examining table and look at it. Can't be done. It's invisible. Nobody can take your will and examine it. It's impossible. Why? It's invisible. Nobody can take the seat of our emotions and lay it on an examining table and examine it. No way. Why? It's invisible. And yes, you see, those are the three things that God is made up of as well as He's created being. You know, when we taught back in Genesis, I, I mentioned more than once. Go through the Scripture, and you'll find that God the Father has mind, will, and emotion. God the Spirit has mind, will, and emotion. God the Son has mind, will, and emotion. And that's what makes them three distinct personalities. But you can't examine any one of those three. They're invisible. And so man was literally created an invisible creation patterned after the invisible spirit God, but in order for man to function in creation, what did God put the invisible man into? A body. And that, of course, had to be because all of creation in basic science is, again, made up of three things, matter, time, and space. Take any one of those away and you don't have a universe. Plain and simple, isn't it? Matter, a star, a moon, a person. We are matter moving through time in space. And that's creation. And so God took this invisible part of us and placed it in a body. And the same way with Himself. See, when He came, and he placed that spirit 
being the very mind, will, and emotion of the Son in a body. And he became then the visible manifestation of the invisible God. And of course, this is why we maintain then that the human being is eternal. Whether he is lost or saved, he's going to live someplace for eternity because God's eternal and man was created in God's image in the, in the sphere of the eternal. Well, anyway, reading on in verse 3, so the Son, who was the brightness of His glory, and He is the express image of His person, that is, the invisible person of the Godhead, and then upholding all things by the word of His power. Now, we won't go back and look up Colossians, but do you remember in the first program we were in Colossians 1 where it said that all things were made by Him and that by Him all things, what was the word? Consist. Everything in the universe is held together by the power of the Word of Christ. If ever He should relinquish that power, the universe would go into fission and it would just utterly be burned up, which will probably happen one day. But nevertheless, everything is held in control by the Word of Christ's power. All right, now reading on. When was that power exercised? When He had by Himself purged our sin. And where did He purge sin? On the cross and in resurrection power. See, now we can't just stop at the cross. That did not finish the work of redemption. That paid the sin debt, of course. His shed blood was the price of redemption. But the power of it all was never released until He arose from the dead three days and three nights later. Now, I guess I could tie this in together. Uh, if I'd skip over to verse uh, 5, and I think maybe I can, uh, let's look at it. It'll be uh, jumping ahead a little bit, more than I plan to do, but I think with this word power, it's appropriate. Verse 5, For unto which of the angels did he at any time say, that is, gone, Thou art my Son, this day I have begotten thee. Well, that's never been spoken to anybody but the Son. All right, now we're going to have to take okay, I thought we had a little more than five minutes, but we only have five minutes left. Come all the way back to Psalms again. We're going to do this rather quickly and come back to Psalms chapter 2. And I made reference to this, I think, in our first half hour this afternoon. Psalms chapter 2, verse 7. Psalms chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 7 because we have to realize and understand that all the power of the Godhead was released when God raised Christ from the dead. All right, verse 7 of Psalms 2, I will declare the decree, The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my Son. This day I have begotten thee. All right, let's go all the way up to the book of Acts. And that's where we have to let Scripture speak. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Where Paul, of course, is speaking there in uh, Antioch of Pisidia. He's in the synagogue and he is preaching to a synagogue full of Jews, and so he's going to use a lot of the Old Testament. Come down to verse 
32. Acts 13, verse 32. And to this Jewish congregation he writes, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made to the fathers, that it is again through the prophets, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that He has raised up Jesus again from the dead. As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten Thee. Now here's where we get the scriptural definition of the only begotten Son of God. And as concerning that, He raised Him up from the dead. What's He talking about? Begotten. Now, no more to retain to corruption. He said in this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. All right, now let's go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And this is all with regard to the term, the only begotten Son of God. It wasn't when he was born at Bethlehem, like a lot of people think, because listen, that was not the result of a sire having a reproduction. The only begotten son was when he was raised from the dead. All right, Romans 1, verse 4. Romans 1, verse 4. And this will just about wind up the program. Verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now here comes verse 4. And declared to be the Son of God with what? Power. Power. According to the Spirit of holiness. And how was that power executed? By the resurrection from God the dead. And oh, we haven't got time, but we could go and whenever Paul speaks of the power of God unto salvation, what is he referring to? The power of his resurrection, at which time Christ overcame all the forces of Satan. He became the epitome of the power of the Creator God. And it was that power that lifted us out of our deadness and out of our sin. And that's why we have to use His resurrection as part and parcel of our gospel. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.